I'm very honored to be on this panel with you, Your Excellency, Hussam. Um, and I'm looking forward to trying to disentangle a bit what the conflict is actually about, <coughs> where it has come, uh, where it has reached to, and where it's headed, and then also trying to see what is the way forward from a Palestinian perspective, and where do you see a role for Germany and for the Europeans sitting here in Berlin. I think that would make some sense. Uh, my name is Muriel Asseburg. I work at Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik, the German Institute for International and Security Affairs here in Berlin. I've been working, amongst other issues, on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict for the last 25 years. And Hussam, uh, ambassador, is a practitioner. So he is currently the head of the Palestinian mission to the UK in London. He is also an advisor to the president on strategic affairs. Before he went to London, he headed the Palestinian delegation in the US before that was shut down. Uh, he is also a politician, so he is a member of Fatah and has been dealing with foreign affairs in the Fatah party. He is also an academic, so he holds a PhD in economics from the University of London. He's been teaching and doing research in London, in Harvard, and also in the Palestinian University, Birzeit University. When we look at the situation in the Middle East, we can see that it is connected to what happened here almost 30 years ago. Uh, the developments, the global developments that led to the fall of the Berlin Wall also gave a push to developments in the Middle East at the time and led to the negotiations or contributed, made it possible for negotiations to take place first in Madrid and then in Washington um, and led also then to the Oslo agreements. So when we go back to 1993, when the Israelis and the Palestinians signed onto the so-called Declaration of Principles, it seemed as if the two parties to the conflict were on a path to peace, peace built on the model of two states coexisting next to each other. Um, and uh, that was what was supposed to be achieved in an interim period. Now, um, in, 19, in, in 2019, sorry, uh, this is definitely not where we are, and this is not, as it seems, where we're headed to. Um, rather, what we are confronted with today is a one-state reality, a reality in which Israel actually controls directly or indirectly the whole of the land between the river and the sea, where uh, it controls not only the territory, but also the airspace, the electromagnetic sphere, the borders, the sea, the, sea, uh, the coast, um, and where the PA, and for that matter also the de facto government in Gaza, is limited to self-administration. Um, we also see that, and that refers again to the subject or, or the theme of that uh, forum here, where since, uh, since and in reaction to the Second Intifada, Israel has built, built a so-called separation wall or separation barrier, which in part really is a high wall uh, that um, really cuts very deep into the territory that was supposed to be the territory of the Palestinian state, which de facto annexes some 8% of West Bank territory. We haven't seen any peace efforts, peace talks taking place since April 2014, when the last uh, talks that were mediated <coughs> by the US broke down. What we have seen since then is a, an effort by the government of Israel to entrench the occupation, to push forward creeping annexation in the West Bank and in Jerusalem. We have seen the continued blockade and isolation of the Gaza Strip, um, leading to a very grave humanitarian situation there, 
and a complete dependency of the population on international aid. We have now, or we are now witnessing, a Palestinian authority which is ever closer to the brink of financial collapse. Um, and the original aims of two states uh, of peace between Israel and the Palestinians uh, and the realization of the Palestinian goal of self-determination seem to be elusive. Uh, it also seems that the so-called deal of the century that the Americans have announced but not put forward doesn't hold a lot of promising uh, content for the Palestinians. So let's try to look at them. <laughs> <laughs> Why does the situation look the way <laughs> it does today? And what is a possible way out of this conundrum? Uh, Hossam, maybe we start by looking back first and, and see what has actually gone wrong over the last 30 years without going into every detail. Uh, what went wrong and what does that tell us also about the conflict? What makes the conflict so intractable, actually? Thank you very much, Morel, and thank you for that very generous introduction uh, of yours. Uh, and allow me first to express my absolute gratitude to the University of Chicago and uh, to the Pearson Institute for giving me and us this honor for the second time in this, this year. The first was really being privileged, honored, uh, to give the third annual lecture of the Pearson Institute uh, this last April. Unfortunately, I couldn't be in person, but I felt as if I was there with the faculty and the students and for sustaining the discussion uh, about uh, conflicts worldwide, but particularly Israel-Palestine, in such a time when there is a deliberate effort to marginalize the issue and to actually push it down the ladder comes the Pearson Institute and the University of Chicago to keep the discussion. And thirdly, for choosing Berlin, uh, to be the place for our gathering. And uh, uh, really, uh, it could not be better location, better timing, the 30 years of the fall of the Berlin Wall. You don't need to study conflict resolution. You just need to come to Berlin to know uh, 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 and to come to terms with the fact that uh, 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 it's all about openness, it's all about unity, uh, it's all about inclusive approach uh, that Berlin uh, offers. And uh, frankly, I will uh, spend the whole day tomorrow walking around just to learn the fruits of uh, the falling of walls and the falling of segregations and separations. And uh, allow me also to uh, express my absolute uh, humbleness and gratitude for Her Excellency, our Ambassador, Dr. Khulud Davis, for being here with us. She honors us. And finally, before I answer your very easy question, or question, <laughs> Yusuf, whom I had the honor of actually recruiting in Washington a couple of years ago, and he was our, what is Yusuf? He was our uh, 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 Congress Affairs Officer. Uh, Yusuf is one of 13 million Palestinians, but Yusuf's story, Yusuf's father, Yusuf's mother, is the story of the 13 million Palestinians. Uh, um, it is the story of the ability of our parents and our society and our nation to raise in us not resentment, not anger, not negative energy, but positive energy. The ability to forgive, the ability to move forward, the ability to be resilient. And actually, I salute him here today for what he had to say and his book and his ability to convey our story in such a, a very effective, uh, effective way. But also, Yusuf's father was so resilient. It wasn't just about forgiveness. It's a, it was about resilience. Staying right in the middle of all these colonial settlements all these years and refusing any attempt at removing him and his family from their own home and land. That is, that is the story of Palestinians. The ones who wonder why we have withstood the pressure of the last hundred years, it's the Yusuf story, it's the hundreds of thousands of, of families who invest in the human capital. By the way, we have one of the, the highest per capita PhD graduates worldwide because our parents, the parents of Yusuf and many of them, have diverted the energy of the Nakba of 1948, of the catastrophe that has happened into the, that energy that uh, brings Yusuf and many others to the fore of international arena. Answering your question, you know, only a couple of weeks ago, I went to my friend, the German ambassador to London, Peter, who was the ambassador in Washington, actually, and we were friends there, to celebrate the 30 years of the fall of the Berlin Wall in London. 
And we also should have celebrated the Palestinians the fall of another wall, almost around the very same time. It was only one year before that, in 1988, there was a major wall uh, uh, that did fall uh, in that time, uh, which is the psychological, uh, political, narrative wall between us. And it was a momentous, transformational moment in 1988 when we, the Palestinians, the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization, finally recognized the fact that there will have to be a solution and that we cannot achieve or we cannot call for absolute justice. It must be relative justice. And then recognizing that we will have to build two states by declaring an independent state of Palestine in the West Bank and Gaza. It was a major wall before that, because before that, we would never engage in a discussion of sharing our land. Before that, it was a, a one-state reality, a one-state solution, a democratic state. And also, that, uh, that moment brought other walls to fall, an Israeli main wall fall, by recognizing the PLO, recognizing the legitimate aspirations of the Palestinian people. So it's important to re remind people that we have not been regressing. And it's important to remind people that while we have all these issues, we have moved a long way during these uh, years. And uh, you know, what followed after 1988 decision by the PLO to actually call for the two-state solution, ally itself with international legitimacy, international legit uh, resolution, was immediately the uh, uh, Madrid Peace Conference and then the Oslo uh, peace process. And these were two Im uh, important milestones in our history. Oslo produced the Oslo peace process. For us and for the international community, Oslo was about implementing the two-state solution. For Israel, may I say for the post-Rabin uh, 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 Israel, because Rabin was assassinated in 1995, and in 1996, uh, uh, Netanyahu won, actually, as early as that time. For uh, Israel, the interpretation was a little bit different. The interpretation was an ability to manage the status quo in a way that is a deteriorating status quo, i.e. status quo minus, with the continuation of the settlement. Then comes the question, answering your question. What went wrong? Why did we get where we are now with all the very accurate description that you uh, described uh, the current reality? The number one answer is that we, the Palestinians, have made a couple of mistakes. The first mistake is entering into such an important historic agreement that is Oslo after that historic moment of 1988, recognizing Israel. We've made an agreement, uh, some mistakes, including accepting to enter into a process that was not reciprocal. We recognized the state of Israel in writing in 1993, signed by the founder of our national movement, the president of, the, of Palestine, Yasser Arafat. We never received a, you know, a reciprocal recognition. I think that was a major mistake because we should have agreed on the final outcome before we started the job. In exchange, we got a letter recognizing the PLO as the legitimate sole representative of the Palestinian people. A good step in the right direction, but that maybe we should have reciprocated either by recognizing the Israeli government as the representative of the Israeli people. But there was a problem there. Also, we should have been much more serious about the text of the agreements, particularly in the arena of the colonial settlements. We made mistakes, and it's important that we learn from our mistakes. The second source of mistake, and I'm not going to here bring Israel, because Israel has made up its mind since 1996 not to head in the direction of a two-state solution. And Netanyahu has made a public promise as early as 1996, only two years after the beginning of the Oslo Accords, that he is there to derail the Oslo peace process, publicly. So let's not even bring Israel into why we failed, because it's a constant factor there. Second reason is the mediator. The sole mediator since the Madrid peace process was the U.S. And I'm not even going to mention Trump now and the Trump administration. I'm talking about the U.S. 
for the last 30 years, which was the sole arbitrator, mediator, broker. And without going into much details why the U.S. has failed, but the U.S. did absolutely fail its part of the deal. Because why did we recognize the State of Israel without Israel recognize us? Why did we engage in a nonviolent campaign and renouncing violence? Why did we endorse the two-state solution and endorse international legitimacy for one reason. Because the U.S. said, should you do that, we will deliver the two-state solution. That was the contract. That was the, the contract. Now, the question is, did the U.S. fail because it didn't want to or it can't? I think it did want to. I think the U.S. had, they wanted to reach an agreement because it serves the strategic interest of the U.S because there is a majority of the Jewish community in the U.S. who are liberals, Democrats, and who really wanted to see a solution, fearing the future of Israel. But it can't, it simply can't, because Israel in the U.S. is not a foreign policy issue. It is a domestic issue, domestic issue. And if we want to go through the heart of the matter, it isn't about the strategic interest of America. It's written in stones that they want to see a Middle East that serves the interests of the U.S. and the region, whereby the core conflict is resolved, that is Israel-Palestine. And I should have said that throughout these 30 years, there was no other conflict on earth that had the clarity of the destination. There was a consensus. Two states, 67, it didn't need much. It's not as complicated as other conflicts. And that international consensus was sustained. There was never a conflict that had the interest of the sole superpower as long as we did. America was set on it. Every administration, early on in their terms, including Trump, by the way. There was never a conflict where the majority of the two sides agree on that international consensus. So we had it all in the right place. So the failure was never a failure of strategy, interest, legality, international legality, or even national legalities, be, be it in America, be it in Europe. The failure was purely political because the political dynamics in America could not actually match its own interest. That's the bottom line. Now, the third and the last, and I think that's the 80% of the failure. It's not only us, it's not only the US. The third and the last and the biggest share of the blame is the international order. The Oslo Accords was the product of an international equilibrium. We were told in the 70s through great statesmen here in Europe that should we ally ourselves with internationalism, with international legitimacy, should we shift from revolutionary legitimacy to international legitimacy? The rest is details. The international order, international system will deliver. If you want my opinion, 80% of the blame is on our international order. The first brick that was built in an illegal settlement after Oslo should have been a cause of international consequences immediately. Because it isn't about Oslo process, it isn't about Israel, it isn't about Palestine, it's about the premise of internationalism. It is about the heart of the international order. What is the heart of international order which was established in this continent, in Europe? It was drafted by you. And it was established in the post-Second World War era because of the never again, because of the horrors that happened in Europe because of the horrors of the Holocaust and the Hiroshima and everywhere. And it was drafted by European legal brains. No Palestinian was involved in the drafting process of the international resolutions and international provisions. But the premise of that order is the inadmissibility of acquiring land by force, full stop. The inadmissibility of acquiring land by force. And therefore, the direct hit since the 1993 was on that premise and on that order. And the consequences today is not just Netanyahu 
three days before the elections, looking all of you in the eyes and saying he vows to annex the Jordan Valley and to annex almost 60% of the occupied Palestinian territories. But the result of that is that many Netanyahu's around the region, without mentioning names, I hold official position, are finding it exactly the opportune moment to wreak havoc, acquire territory by force, annex territory by force. We are upon the demise of the international order. Thanks, Hussam. When we look at the current situation and we stay with Israel-Palestine... Um, it is uh, about Israel-Palestine. Uh, absolutely. I, I just don't want to go into other cases now, but stay there. Um, the, the, the issue that, that I would like to ask about is um, where do you see the main impediments now moving forward? And I think you mentioned one important factor right now, and that is the international consensus. Now, when we listened to the representative, at the moment still representative of the US government in front of the Security Council in September, uh, speaking about the international consensus, it seemed to me that he said there is no international consensus on Israel-Palestine, and he also said that international law wouldn't be helpful in resolving the conflict. So, Maybe you can try to be a bit systematic in seeing where are actually the concrete barriers to peace now in the international environment, but also when you look at uh, the two conflicting parties, Israel and the Palestinians. In addition to what I have just uh, outlined in terms of the major barriers over the last 30 years, but in these 30 years, we had a U.S. administration, successive administrations, that were absolutely interested in the vision, that is the two-state solution, committed to the vision. And we had a U.S. administration as a mediator committed to the investment towards that vision, i.e. the Palestinian Authority, the institutions, UNRWA, what have you, the civil society in Palestine, uh, that, are, that form the basis, the pillars, if you may, of the uh, state of Palestine to come. But in the last two, three years, uh, that has ended. Uh, so we have uh, another problem of the mediator uh, themselves abandoning that uh, vision. So what you have seen over the last three years was not just you know, a tactical uh, uh, steps by the Trump administration to try and pressure us, as he keeps saying on his tweets, that we must be pressured and come back to negotiations. No, that was a very deliberate strategic uh, moves to actually de-recognize the Palestinian leadership the Palestinian people, the Palestinian issue. Why would they close our mission and send Yusuf unemployed for the last couple of, year, uh, of months? Uh, uh, it's not about Yusuf, it's not about the ambassador, it's not about, it's about the flag that flies there, which represents a collective Palestinian. Why would they shatter the U.S. Consulate General that was there since 1884? I mean, it was there long before the State of Israel. And it was there to serve the, as the key contact between the people and the governments of the U.S. and Palestine. Guess what they call it now? They, they, they closed it, they shuttered it, but they now moved the staff within the U.S. Embassy to Israel. And they call it Palestinian Affairs Unit. It's a unit. So what does that tell you? It's a strategic move. By the way, Ambassador Friedman, David Friedman, the U.S. ambassador, was so obsessed about this move because he is the ideological, strategic mind behind this. Because for this administration, the Palestinian issue, I should not have said for this administration, for Netanyahu, who has his allies in this administration? The Palestinian issue is not a, an issue between two different national camps. It's an issue that is internal within Israel. And then the second step from that, they should not be talking to us, the Palestinians, they should be talking to the region to resolve that, some parts of that internal issue in Israel. Now, <clears throat> and I'm saying this because it is very important to understand all the steps that has been taken and why they are been taken. There are so many misperceptions. The first misperception is that we boycotted the U.S., we started a policy of no contact. Absolutely not true. It's the U.S. that boycotted us. I mean, how can anybody 
allow me two minutes to say the story. I was appointed to Washington in, on the 1st of April 2007. That was two months after the inauguration or three months of President Trump. So that was a decision by our leadership, our president, President Abbas, to actually engage the U.S. administration. And since that, I arranged for the first visit of our president, President Abbas, to Washington on the 3rd of May 2017. The engagement between us and the U.S. administration was at the highest level, was sustained, and let me stick my neck out and say, was positive. The discussions with President Trump over four times in a few weeks were promising. Even the chemistry was not bad. At the very high, and every time we would meet President Trump, or even some of his team, we would be you know, feeling that actually it's not as bad as it looks. We might get somewhere. At the height of that engagement, at the height of the honeymoon, I must have visited the White House in these uh, you know, 36 times I counted that I met the team. At the height of that honeymoon, I received a phone call from the State Department on the at 5.35 p.m. on the 16th of November, 2017. And there was a mumbling voice, I couldn't really, uh, and he was a friend of mine, who was the head of the Middle East Department, Near East and North Africa Department, in the State Department. A good friend, Michael Ratney, he was the U.S. Consul General before that. You know him. And Michael wanted to tell me bad news, <laughs> which was surprising, most likely to him, and also to me. And he said, your office is to be closed. I really thought he was referring to an office in Ramallah. To... And I'm saying at the very height of our honeymoon, there was no issue. There was no tension. There was nothing. How would you destroy a relationship? What is the one act that would destroy a relationship? Closing the embassy. I mean, if you cl close the embassy, so somebody in the White House, somebody in the administration, by the way, foreign policy issues in the U.S. is purely an executive matter. There is a wavering. Somebody in the administration decided to destroy, dismantle what we built over the few months before. Now, I, don't, I cannot go much further because I was told we are live and at the restriction of time. But Netanyahu has learned that the relationship is being built in a, in a constructive way. He has learned that what our, our leadership has been able to present was logical, was convincing. And he feared the continuation of that discussion. And he got his guys right in the middle of that process abruptly. I'll mention one name, Sheldon Adelson. Do you know who's Sheldon Adelson? The casino guru? Because the previous engagement with the Trump administration was also because of the pressure of the majority of the Jewish community in the U.S. who really want to see a solution. The majority. But then the minority got in in full force. And then the rest is details. The moment they inform me that the, our mission will be closed, in no time, in two, three days, the declaration on Jerusalem, moving of the embassy, cutting funding to UNRWA, uh, uh, shattering the U.S. Consulate General in, in, in East Jerusalem, uh, cutting all funding to the Palestinian Authority, cutting all U.S. aid even to the civil society. Put all these things together, then you will come up with this. It, it was about the dismantlement of the entire basis of the peace process that we have been engaged for the last 30 years. It was about attacking the vision, which is the two-state solution, because if you are talking about two-state solution, you need Palestinian representatives in Washington. You need American representatives in Jerusalem. You need this to support the central authority that is the nucleus of the state that is the Palestinian authority. You need UNRWA to sustain the right of the refugees until we resolve that very important issue. And you need to sustain the Palestinian civil society, which employs 27,000 Palestinian, 27, Palestinians. That is a backbone for us. If you hit all those, then you are denationalizing de the Palestinian issue. So it wasn't tactical, it was strategic. Now, not everything is fate, especially if it comes from Mr. Trump. 
we resisted and we took a very clear position and we believe that their assumptions were three and they were mistaken, they were wrong. The first assumption is that we, the Palestinians, are the weakest link, the weakest party, and we will come back to the US table no matter what. It didn't happen, and read my lips, it will not happen. We are the, we are the weakest party, but we are the party that has, has nothing to lose, except our rights, of course. Number two assumption is that the Arab world is going to sell us off. That's not true. And it will not happen because the relationship between us and the Arab world is not just a political relationship. It is a kinship relationship. It's about civilization, religion, history. <coughs> and it didn't happen and it will not happen. And I can break the news that the meeting between our president and the king of Saudi Arabia only two days ago was excellent. We were identical. And all down the line since then. And the third assumption is that the international community is so fatigued and tired and we will uh, recruit Nikki Haley to dismantle the international framework that governs the Palestinian issue. And Germany will not defend its own position and the rest of the world will not defend their position. That was also a wrong assumption. Germany did defend its position. And I must salute the German position and Chancellor Merkel position. And Europe did defend its position. And the US position remains to be isolated. Yes, they got Honduras couple of uh, months ago, and you know, it did it before in the 80s with Costa Rica, and then they shifted back to Tel Aviv, if you know the history. But they did not, and they will not so far get any uh, international uh, uh, acquaintance with that approach. So we are not in the worst of places, but we are in a very uncomfortable uh, place. And uh, Moriel, I think uh, uh, at this point in time, the only possibility is that we look for international mechanisms for uh, peacemaking. The U.S. cannot be the sole mediator, and uh, not only because of uh, the Trump administration. It's because of the situation in the U.S. It's crucial that we keep focusing on creating an international mechanism for peacemaking, international peace conference, internationalizing negotiations rather than just being stuck in a process that has failed for the last 30 years. Mm. Thanks, Hussam. Maybe we can look at this in a bit more detail. Um, I First, I think it would be helpful if you can explain, you talked about the decision that the PLO took in 1988. Is this still the vision that you're following? Is this where the Palestinians are headed? When we look, <clears throat> when we look at opinion polls in the Palestinian territories, uh, it doesn't seem so. I mean, the majority of Palestinians now don't have any hope in a two-state approach, and they're turning ever more even though that hasn't a majority either, but they're turning ever more towards a, uh, a struggle for equal rights in one political entity. Uh, does that affect where the official Palestinian leadership wants to go? Um, connected to that is who is actually representing the Palestinians today? I mean, you wouldn't discount, I guess, that there is a severe lack uh, of legitimacy in the current leadership and that there needs to be a renewal. Now the president has been speaking about elections, but we've also heard that kind of before. So will there be elections? And if there are elections, <coughs> what entity will be elected? Um, and what kind of environment do we actually need for elections to make sense? And then go back to the question of what is the threat? <coughs> The strategy? How do we get from where we are now to where we want to be? You have six hours? No, we have, uh, we still have some time. And you know that we also want to be speaking about Germany later. Also. So leave some time. <laughs> I leave Her Excellency to speak about Germany. I speak about uh, Britain and Brexit, if you want to discuss Brexit. <laughs> uh, Okay, about the, uh, the two-state solution, let me explain something that I think is, is, is missed in the discussion. People think the two-state solution is a Palestinian demand. Uh, wherever we go uh, now, they tell us, oh, you, I know you demand uh, a two-state solution, uh, you aspire, uh, the territory uh, you claim to be yours, language like this, even in major you know, newspapers, that the Palestinians want to be their state, the land, the territory that the Palestinians want to be. This is really, really, it must end. 
Number one, the Palestinian, uh, uh, um, you know, the two-state solution was never a Palestinian demand. It was a Palestinian concession. And it was a Palestinian concession towards becoming uh, uh, allied with international legitimacy. <clears throat> For Palestinians, it doesn't make sense that early on, you, the starting point of foregoing 78% of what was rightly yours. You don't start there, you start somewhere else. Having said that, for us, the Palestinians, let me confirm, we have two possible acceptable options for the future. The first is <clears throat> two states on the 1967 borders, a state of Palestine, sovereign, we're not talking about Mickey Mouse state, sovereign, independent. East Jerusalem is our capital, not a capital in East Jerusalem, not shared capital in Jerusalem, not the fantasy and the fallacy that we will establish a capital in Abu Dis. East Jerusalem from the exact line, you know road one? And this is final, by the way, it's final. One of the biggest mistakes that people thought that us accepting and recognizing the two-state solution was the beginning of our concessions. No, 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 it was the end of our concessions. It was the maximum we could offer and it's the minimum we could accept. And that's why you, Israel has tried so hard over the years with Yasser Arafat and with President Abbas and maybe with another that's the national equilibrium we built. A state living in peace, and we mean it, and security, if we can coordinate under occupation, let alone what we can do in a post-conflict scenario. And we realize the huge potential between us and Israel. We know that should we resolve the conflict on that basis, the partnership will create a blast in the positive sense because Israel has the most high-tech economy, very well exposed, connected to the US, uh, you know, the Silicon Valley, and we have the most educated, youthful society. And we both sit in a region that need us. The Israelis need us to connect them eastward, and we need them to connect us westward, and the bridge will certainly create a crossroad of civilizations, and we realize that potential. Now, Israel is trying to play smart and go to east without us. It's not going to work. It's an exaggerated attempt by Netanyahu. <clears throat> and we think we can just, you know, uh, penetrate westward everywhere without Israel. Also, we need to assess that. The second option is one person, one vote, one democratic, egalitarian, state that provides for all of its citizens, regardless of uh, your language, your religion, your color, your height, your width. A state in the meaning of a state. And I say it maybe on behalf of my Palestinian side, we will accept either. It's not like we are obsessed. We are obsessed about a solution. But we know that the second option is a non-starter in Israel. We know that. And you know why? Do I need to dwell on it? Because Israel see us, the Palestinians, primarily as a dem demographic threat. Because the dream of establishing a state of all of its citizens might be generations away. Because only a few months after the Israeli state nation state law that discriminated against the Palestinian citizens of Israel and deliberately told them that they can never have the right of self-determination. It's exclusive to Jews. In such an environment, to aspire to that is really to be almost like wanting to fight a heavyweight boxer when you are unable to even defeat a lightweight. And that's why we are more in the arena of possibility rather than desirability. And from a possibility point of view, we remain to be convinced that the two-state solution is still possible. 
it's possible. And we remain convinced that it is the best course towards the immediate future. We remain to be convinced it takes some political will in the part of Israel, our part, and in the part of the international community to implement. We have invested so much over a long time to build the structures of the state to come. So we should not be like you know, children who get bored of their toys and destroy it. And I can now confirm our official policy. We will defend the vision of the two-state solution. Because when Trump has broken the contract between the Palestinians and the US, Germany did not. Britain did not. The EU did not. And by the way, the EU's investment in the two-state solution is way more than the US investment in the two-state solution. We will respect that. We will respect our international commitments. We will respect the vision, and we will defend it. And by the way, if you see every act that our president does, the Palestinian president, the Palestinian leadership, the Palestinian institutions, every act is to confirm the vision, which is a two-state solution. And every act we do is to preserve the investments we made towards the two-state solution. Now, I don't know for how long that can sustain, but I can tell you and assure you, it's a commitment. Having answered that, for us, the two-state solution cannot be achieved with the current dynamics. Because there is one word that is missing if we really want to achieve a one-state, a two-state solution. And morally, you know, you can tell the audience what you saw in Palestine last week when you visited. We are already in the one-state reality. We are already in the apartheid reality, already. It's not like we are going into. When you have one government, one government, in Tel Aviv, the Israeli government, that controls the entire land from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean and operates three distinct separate legal systems, one for Israeli Jews, one for the Palestinian citizens of Israel, and one for the Palestinians under military occupation. If you go to the UN and ask them the definition of that operating of three different systems, it's apartheid. So we know what's the alternative to the current reality. To break away from the current reality requires one word. One word, consequences. Consequences. For too long, there was no consequences of actually deviating from this vision. That's it. And these consequences could be done so easily. So easily. Try, try, just try to ban settlement produce. And this is not a Palestinian demand. It's a German and European and international legal responsibility. Because it's you who have decided and told us that Israel's expansionism beyond the 1967 border is illegal. Would you, so the European Union engaged some 15 years ago of labeling settlement produce, which did not actually materialize. It never happened. Stopped somewhere. But labeling, like bank robbers, you know, they go to a bank, they rob a bank, you catch them, then you just put a stick to them. You know, these are bank robbers. No, they committed an illegal, an illegal act. Try the banning of, and I, I don't think this is a big, big deal to actually apply the law, your law. Try to ban settlement produce. And go and read all Israeli studies. You will find out that the majority of Israeli settlers that are the key obstacle to the two-state solution are there not for ideological reasons, not for political reasons, for economic reasons. At least two-thirds of the settlers in the settlements are there for economic and financial reasons. Banning settlement produce would immediately create a disincentive. It will be viral and spiral. Try to see the legal and social responsibility of European and international companies who illegally operate in these settlements. Help us if you really want the two-state solution. We got resolution 2334 from the UN Security Council resolution and 
Europe voted with us, the two seats in the Security Council, France and, and the UK, with the support of Germany, to release, to, cl to clearly state the illegality of settlements and to build consequences. And I had the honor, the privilege of being part of the team working on that, because we knew we have to build consequences. Excellent. Obama allowed us to get the Obama administration to get a UN Security Council resolution that talks about international responsibility and talks about consequences, finally. And that resolution called for the release of a database, just a database, of international companies that illegally operate in these settlements, illegally operate in these settlements. Since then, we have been hitting our heads against all walls to release that database, which is ready, by the way. The UN was mandated by the Security Council to put together that list, it's ready. And it's unreleased until now. Why? You know the reason, you know the, the answer to why. I'm not gonna engage in it. There are so many examples that one can do, we can do together to apply the law. Number two, if, we, if you really want to implement the two-state solution, because many people are saying, what can we do? There are so many small but significant steps that could be done, and it will get us where we all want to get. Number two, why is it that Germany or Britain or France, why you don't recognize the state of Palestine? What is the logic? What is the logic? I ask my British colleagues in the Foreign Office in Number 10 Street, the government, in the parliament, and they say, we will. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. We definitely recognize the legitimacy and the need to recognize the state of Palestine, but we will do it when it serves the peace process and when it is an outcome of a final agreement. And I look at them, I said, okay, fine, fine, fine. Excellent. Why did you recognize Israel then, if it's an outcome of a final agreement? By recognizing one state of the two states you espouse, you give that one state a license to encroach. Right, Professor? And that's exactly what has been happening for the last 52 years. So you must level the field. Either you de-recognize de one and then you know, wait for the final agreement to recognize the two, or you recognize the second. I think the first is very difficult. We call for the second. You could not imagine the shockwaves in the positive sense, the energy, the hope this will instate, the seriousness of the world should this happen. Sweden did it. We thought the sky will fall on Sweden. No, it didn't. It just proven to be gutsy, brave, principled. The pub did it only a couple of years ago. And yes, we vow for him with his moral authority and why not the rest of Europe do it if we really want to deliver a message to these settlers, to the Netanyahu vowing, to the spiral cancerous end of our hope for at least a two-state solution? Why don't we send this message now? What are we waiting for? And I can see some officials from the German side. What are we waiting for? And I'll say this and I'll end this discussion. It is no longer if it's not now, when. We are at a moment when we can surely say, if it's not now, never. Why would I want a recognition after two, three years? It's over. And number three, and finally, if we want to reach a, a, a two-state solution, do not leave it all to the US. We have to help the US, even in a post-Trump era, because we don't believe Trump can, can, can really have any credibility to deal with our issue. Don't leave the US alone. And don't believe anybody who says this is not the core of issues, that there are other issues that concern us. Syria is on fire. Yes, of course, it's a major thing. And the suffering is big. It's acute. But it is the core of the conflict in the region from many aspects. Which issue keeps coming to your Bantustag? Which issue is always in the Congress? Laws against us, with us, the Palestinians. Which cause still sends tens of thousands of people to the streets? It's the issue of Palestine, because it's an issue that has to do with people's identity. 
So no matter what you want to, or some want to argue that this is not the core of all, no, it is in the region. And every Arab would tell you that. So the third, if we don't want to leave it to the US, and it was a, 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 a structural mistake, actually, to accept that there is one country that is the mediator. Because you are experts of, of, of conflict resolutions. Name me one conflict, name me, please, one conflict. Over the last 100 years, how was that? That was not resolved via international mechanism. Name me one. East Timor? South Africa? Northern Ireland? The Balkans? Kosovo? Each one of them was via heavy, sustained internationalism. The deal with Iran? You know, if the deal with Iran was only mediated by the US, it would have, it would have exploded long ago. So the question is not why, why should the Palestinians uh, 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 have international negotiations and international peacemaking. The question is why were we made the exception? That's the question. Why we were made the exception? And the answer is the Israeli pressure that they do not want to see the will of the international community on the negotiation table and their condition is only the US, which Israel believes is to its absolute side, would deliberate this. This is an opportunity, and I, I just want to say that Trump has caused so much damage. President Trump and this administration has caused, has, has, has caused us so much damage, but it also gives us opportunities. Opportunities. One of these opportunities is to internationalize mediation and to build a process that could actually achieve that outcome we are talking about. Elections, the, our president has announced the convening of elections on the UN podium. So it couldn't be more global, more serious, uh, uh, and it couldn't be a better moment. And the announcement is because of the realization that we Palestinians could wage many struggles at all fronts, but our home front is a key uh, point, and we realize that we must renew our democratic process. We must. We have not done so, not because we didn't want to, and I assure you that every Palestinian, chiefly among them is President Mahmoud Abbas, realizes that 90% of our power is our democratic process. And we know that we have survived all these years because there has been a democratically elected leadership and democratic institutions. Who else do we represent if we sit on this seat or any other seat? And the PLO has managed to create its own form of democracy. And when, we, when the PLO returned back to Palestine, we were able to convene an election in 1996. Yasser Arafat could not only lead us via the historic legitimacy of founding our movement or the revolutionary legitimacy of starting our revolution. He had to gain his legitimacy via the ballot box. Yasser Arafat, and I tell you, he didn't need it. <laughs> So did Abu Mazen. And then when Abu Mazen was elected in 2005, the first step, few months later, is to convene elections for the parliament. That is the PLC. Now, the rest is history. I don't know what they did. They just <coughs> stole us five minutes. The rest is history. <laughs> the rest is history. And I know you want to talk about Germany, and I'm happy to do that in the last five minutes. The rest is history because, unfortunately, Gaza, Gaza has been... In 2005, <clears throat> when so many people were discussing the, the Israeli disengagement from Gaza, many were saying this is going to be a trap to create a void, and the void will be filled by what happened, actually, a year and a half later. It happened, and that has created its own negative dynamics on our political system, the Hamas coup d'etat, and the division that has lasted all these years. But the decision by our president, and I know that, is to convene elections despite that. And to find all ways and any alternative to refer back to the people. And we have two major obstacles here. The first is not actually Hamas, the first is Netanyahu, because without convening elections in East Jerusalem, we will have a problem. We cannot convene national elections without our capital. And we have 300, thousand Palestinians, including Her Excellency, our ambassador here from East Jerusalem. 
And we cannot convene national elections without two million of our people in Gaza. So the discussion now are happening about finding a mechanism or mechanisms to allow us to convene elections in East Jerusalem and in Gaza. And we are calling on our international friends. And I was instructed to ask the several governments to actually help us ensure that Netanyahu will not, or Israel will not prevent us from convening elections to our people. And also we are using our inter regional partners and, and brothers to help with the Gaza and the Hamas. We are serious about elections. That's, 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 that's the answer. Hussam, let's get back for the last three minutes to uh, Berlin, to Germany. When, when I follow the discussion in our country here, uh, my feeling is that talking about the conflict has become very toxic. Every criticism of uh, Israeli government policy is very easily equated with anti-Semitism. Uh, we had the decision, the motion of the German parliament in May that uh, said that the BDS movement, the Palestinian non-violent civil movement, uh, uses arguments and methods that are anti-Semitic. Uh, but of course, it's about more than just the BDS movement. It's about delegitimizing Palestinian um, aspirations, rights, and actors. Um, that is the climate that we're currently having, and it leads to a situation where we don't have people standing up, actually, for what you are demanding. And on the other side, we do have a real problem of anti-Semitism, and we see the violent consequences of that happening in Germany. So what is your way of, of dealing with that? That's a very tough question, really. It's a very, very tough question for a Palestinian. <clears throat> but let me attempt to answer it from a Palestinian. Number one, anti-Semitism is real. It's real. It happened, it's happening. Nowhere else more than Germany knows that. And Jews have suffered. They have suffered throughout history. We know that as Palestinians. We do. And fighting anti-Semitism and eradicating, er 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 eradicating anti-Semitism is a must, and I believe it's a universal mission for all of us. And there is no but and there is no if. Because I believe as a Palestinian, I do believe that those who hate Jews are those who hate Muslims. They are the same. You cannot have hatred in your heart and discrimination only to one group. You just hate the other. And I, as a Palestinian, also understand the cost of discrimination. I really do. I've lived it all of my life. By the, by the way, I was born in a, in a tent in a refugee camp as a consequence of discrimination, of denial. And I see no contradiction. I see no contradiction between those who fight anti-Semitism, including myself, and those who fight Israeli expansionism. In fact, there is no way that one can convince me that he or she fights anti-Semitism and they will not fight Israeli expansionism and vice versa. It's the very same fight. It is. And go all over the world and see who are the main agencies that help us internationally. You will find them, it's the majority of the Jewish communities everywhere. I lived in the US before I was an ambassador. And I came to learn that the actual agency that pushes for a real solution is the Jewish community in the US, the 70% of them. So we also need to build bridges, but there is a small minority who are on purpose want to conflate things. This is the end, not the if and the but, it's the end. Conflate things on purpose to delegitimize, to uh, 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 create poisonous discussion, toxic discussions, and to push further the ability to reach a solution because people will be fearing even engaging in the discussion. Anti-Semitism is a very serious charge. And therefore, 
because we are in Germany, because we are in Berlin, this is an opportunity, really, to call on the German government and the German Bundestag. Because Germany has done so much good for us, the Palestinians. It did. Germany has done so much good to Jews worldwide and to Israel. Germany has kept its promises throughout the year. Germany has lived up to its commitments. It did. In every sense, and I'm not being a diplomat here, but we know the difficulty that Germany has gone through, and we are inspired by the German experience. This ability to come together after all these wounds, this ability to build this source of good in the world and source of prosperity. But Germany has the ability to help us redirect the discussion. Because it has that capital, it can help us redirect that discussion. A motion in the Pontestan that people who uses their pockets or their stomach to mark illegality are anti-Semitic is an illegal motion, not even a political motion. We must now enable us. If you really want to reach a solution, we must have the guts and the courage to have this discussion in a healthy situation. Of course, there is anti-Semitism, and we must fight it. And of course, there is Israeli expansionism, colonialism, occupation, besiegement, denial of basic rights, which has nothing to do. And by the way, Israeli occupation does not mean it's a... It's only Jewish uh, soldiers. We, you know, the Israeli army has Christian soldiers and Muslim soldiers, many Muslim soldiers. And this is where I end. Because there are two camps. There is the camp that wants us to believe, and they are becoming very strong, that this is a Jewish-Muslim conflict, that this is a religious conflict. Friedman, that is David, that is the U.S. ambassador in Israel, when he had that hammer underneath Al-Aqsa Mosque only a few months ago, opening the so-called tunnel, was starting that religious war, that Armageddon. That group is the cause of the conflating of these two issues here. And there is the other group who believe that these two issues are complementary. And if you truly want to fight hatred, you fight it across the board. If you truly want to apply values, they cannot be subdivided. Israelis, Palestinians, Germans, we must live in a situation whereby all these rules. And I have a, I, I have a belief that if we are unable to correct this and to stand for this and create a, a healthy environment for the discussion, I don't think the two-state solution will be achieved within the foreseeable future because this toxic discussion will definitely silence the very forces that would enable us to get to that final resolution. Thank you so much, Hussam. Thank you, everybody, for listening patiently. And, um, yeah, help me in applause. <laughs>